Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for another session of the WNS Operative Ground Rounds. Today we have with us Dr. Cormac Maher from the University of Michigan. Our discussion will be about management of controversial lesions such as arachnoid cysts and pineal cysts. Actually, this is the first session of a series of three sessions uh, which will be discussing a management of controversial cerebral lesions. The second and third uh, conferences or the web conferences will be discussing uh, management of Chiari malformations as well as incidental vascular lesions respectively. Cormac, thank you again for joining us and we're looking forward to hearing your valuable information. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate the uh, invitation to present today on a topic that I think is uh, of interest, hopefully, to many neurosurgeons. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. I do have many people uh, to acknowledge that I've worked with over the past several years on these topics, so you can see here, and some of whom will be named uh, uh, later in the presentation. Uh, I believe that intracranial cysts are an important topic because they present a neurosurgical outpatient practice with a great frequency, um, and frequently they are associated with symptoms that are also very, very common in normal children or in children with abnormalities that aren't necessarily related to the cysts. I have here a list of common neurological symptoms that can occur in children with or without any associated pathology that can be seen on the MRI scan. Headaches, as we'll get into in this presentation, are a relatively common symptom in children, not necessarily although they might be associated with pathological entities, are not necessarily associated with pathological entities of interest to neurosurgeons. Developmental delay, also very common. Childhood seizures, common. Failure to thrive, depending on how it's defined, very, very common. And macrocrania, again, depending on how it's defined, can be very, very common. I mentioned that headaches are, are a frequent occurrence in children. Uh, and in fact, a recent survey appearing in the British uh, Journal of General Practice defined, at least in the British population, that 20% of adolescents had complained of a headache one or more times each week, and that 6% of adolescents had a headache several times a week or even every day. So headaches, at least in adolescents, are not particularly rare. Seizures, as, as this audience knows very well, is also very common, at least single seizures. Turning that issue on its head, looking at MRI findings now, there are also very, very common findings on MRI that are not necessarily of, of uh, at least treatment interest to neurosurgeons. Vascular entities such as deep venous anomalies, uh, postnatal hematomas, very common if we image uh, newborn babies, Chiari malformations, lipomas, cysts, and so on, all may be found as incidental findings in the pediatric population. And this raises what I regard as an important issue, which is that there are common incidental findings in pediatric neuroimaging, and there are common symptoms in children which may or may not be related to these common findings on MR imaging. And I think it's up to the neurosurgeon to be very, very cautious when ascribing anything more than a coincidental association to these entities. This slide I've taken from the New England Journal of Medicine, an excellent article written in 1986 by Mould and others, where they describe something that they called the cascade effect. And I think this is an important point to understand for any pediatric practice, especially a pediatric neurosurgical practice. In many cases, a primary care physician will order a test to be cautious. Because there is a symptom and they don't want to miss anything potentially serious, a test is ordered. And that test is abnormal. For instance, it might show an arachnoid cyst, it might show a Chiari malformation, or any number of other relatively common findings on neuroimaging. This leads to parental or patient anxiety, a specialist is consulted, sometimes leading to more tests. And then down this cascade a little bit, the parents are anxious, in some cases the treating physicians are anxious, and occasionally a surgical treatment can be perceived as a safe alternative to doing nothing, and a surgical procedure is carried out sometimes without completely understanding whether or not that needed to be done. And this leads to the concept of the folie a deux, where a pair of people, a, a patient or their family, as well as the treating physician, can sometimes enter into a relationship where something is, is done that is improper 
even with the best of intentions. The patient or the family, they have good intentions. They're looking for an explanation for the child's symptoms. They want the symptoms to be taken.